Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to take you from the beautiful research stuff that we've heard yesterday and today down onto the very practical stuff on the ground. This, you might remember, was Super Typhoon Haiyan. It was, at the time, the strongest storm ever measured at landfall. Um, most of what you see there was underwater for about four hours and possibly 15 feet underwater. It was basically the bottom of the ocean for a period of time. The storm intensity was remarkable. And here we have cyclones coming into Yemen. Um, that, you know, these things just should not be words put together. Um, that was 10 days ago, and I think many of you recognize that we just saw it again. Yemen's been hit by the second cyclone in 10 days, just yesterday. And Yemen should not be having cyclones. We also have some very bad man-made stuff. Many of you are tracking what's happening in Southeast Asia with the Indonesian fires all man-made problems that are shutting down flights in Malaysia, closing schools in Indonesia, altering the way people are breathing in Bangkok. And we are seeing temperatures that are almost unprecedented since we became bipedal. If you look at that closely, you'll see that that top green, 52 degrees, a heat index of 158 degrees Fahrenheit. And for those of you that are tracking the geopolitics of climate change, you'll notice that that green is on the eastern half of Iraq, a place that already was marginal in many ways, and this makes people angry because you can't stay inside when there are temperatures like that and you don't have power. Related to that is the fact that many of the areas that are most at risk in the world for water are areas that are already a little bit unstable, a little bit undereducated, a little bit angry, somewhat overpopulated, underemployed, and several of them are energy producers, and that has geopolitical implications as well. And then, of course, there's conflict. As many of you have recognized, there was a report that came out in June that said we have more people on the move, more population displaced than we have had since World War II something on the order of 61 million people. This one, this, no, uh, this uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photograph is from South Sudan, but um, when you talk about a displaced population, it's important to recognize what that actually looks like. This is the Yarmouk camp in Damascus. This was about a year and a half ago and just before the barrel bombs started in this camp. We also have some evidence that there's been mustard, some evidence there's been chlorine. Um, this is a population that is now on the move into southern Europe. I flew in yesterday from Riga, Latvia, where I was attending a conference that was focused mostly by NATO on issues associated with displaced populations coming in from the Levant in southern Europe, into southern Europe. And then we have what you would expect. We have emerging infections. A lot of that is being driven by the alteration in the placement of vectors for disease carriers. Um, as you may know, we have dengue, not too far from San Diego now, and we have chikungunya. Um, Ebola is the one that we've been focused on for the last uh, year and a half or so. Um, I was one of the many, many people on the White House Ebola response team. Um, that has turned out to be statistically almost unmeasurable in the scope of human disease on the planet. However, the consequences are very severe. And the breakdown in healthcare systems because of the loss of about one in seven healthcare providers in West Africa has meant that, as the British Medical Journal showed in July, there are now more malarial excess mortality deaths in West Africa because of the breakdown of the healthcare system that had to be entirely redirected into Ebola, and then people who were healthcare providers died. More people have died of excess malarial deaths than died of Ebola. And that is going to continue. That's a shortfall in healthcare that's going to be very difficult to correct. Chikungunya, we talked about actually on this stage about three years ago because it was something that epidemiologically we've been tracking for a number of years that had begun back in World War II, first time it was detected, then it came kind of up around the east coast of Africa, across South Asia, down Southeast Asia. We thought it was going to go from there to the Philippines, to Hawaii, to make its entree into the Americas. That's not what happened. 
it actually leapfrogged to the Dominican Republic. In November of 2013, so two years ago, we documented the first case, the index case in the Dominican Republic. As PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, documents on this graph, inside 12 months, we went from one case to one million in more than a dozen countries in the Americas. That's remarkable, and that's the kind of thing that we're facing in the field, and we don't have all the tools we need to look at that adequately. Because this is what it really looks like when somebody's taking a big picture view. I picked a random time a month ago, chose a week worth of reports, 792 infectious disease outbreaks on what you and I would call the One Health model. So looking at diseases that are in humans, in livestock, in wildlife, and in crops. All of those have some effect on us. Many of them can become zoonotic. And remember that zoonotic diseases, as Janet Ginsburg has taught me, go both ways. We can have diseases that infect animals just as much as they infect us. We tend to lose track of that, and that complicates the epidemiology. Many of the people that are subject to those new diseases or those diseases that are old in new places are highly vulnerable. This is an example of what we need to understand about the demographics that all of you are going to be serving over the next 30 years. The Western world, the developed world, is actually slightly decreasing in population, and yet we hear frequently that the UN habitat projections show an extra 2 billion people appearing on the planet between now and 2050. That's true, but they are almost all in the cities most of those in the secondary cities, so a million people or less, and most of those in the peripheral informal settlements, so the slums of the developing world. That's a lot of impact that doesn't have much to do with the very fortunate stuff that we're talking about for the 1% and above that have been discussed for the moment um, in the past two days, and that will eventually trickle elsewhere, but I think that we should be doing some aiming in other ways than just what we have heard so far. Because this is what a slum looks like, and not many people get out to these places. It's hard to understand what it smells like, what day-to-day -day life is like. Um, I used to run a laboratory in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. This is not too far from that lab. Um, and the life that is going on in there is rich and complex and not altogether unpleasant. Obviously, it's very difficult in some ways, but there's a rich ecosystem inside the communities that live in here, and we don't know much about it, and that's an important message because we have to deliver health care, health care systems, health care point of care to these populations as time goes on. It may not be happening now, but it should happen soon. And we don't know much about how these places are organized. These informal settlements come together as complex adaptive systems. They have nonlinear responses. They have emergent behaviors. They have resources and influences and characteristics that are all but invisible to those of us who are on the outside of these areas. There are some people that are thinking carefully about this, and this is one, Patrick Meyer. Um, a colleague of mine from the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative who has done some beautiful work also with the Cotter Foundation, putting together ideas about the, the groundswell of efforts at humanitarian support using, in most cases, digital technologies and often done in the informal sector, coming from crowdsourcing, coming from local volunteers, and he has looked at a number of problems. Those are chapters in, in that book and I recommend it to you, it's only been out since about August, and he describes some of the incredibly exciting things that are being done, often with exponential technologies, and getting better just as fast as you would expect exponential technologies to progress. This is one of the places they were used. Um, I lead the disaster response team for the Roddenberry Foundation. Those of you familiar with Star Trek will remember that Gene Roddenberry, um, created Star Trek, and the Roddenberry Foundation is supported by the Star Trek franchise. They support, and I'm very grateful, by the way, thank you, everybody, um, and the Roddenberry Foundation for the stuff that we do in the field. Um, this was a few days after that happened, and we were already 
around people who were using UAVs with cameras to peer into those upper floors and see if we could identify where there might be people trapped, where there might be people in need of care, and it's working better than you might expect. That technology is maturing very quickly. We're also working very hard to figure out where people are in rubble. Um, this Mexico team, an urban search and rescue team, is extremely talented. They're very skilled, they're very brave, and right now what he is trying to do is get to a woman who was screaming. Um, she knew that there was help nearby. Nobody had recognized that she was there. Get, you'll see the jackhammer in the upper corner with the, uh, with the dark blue. Um, this is a difficult place to understand where there might be people trapped, and we need technologies that help us understand where there might be life in rubble. This is helping. This is the winner of the DARPA Robotics Challenge this year. It's a Korean team, and even though that's a humanoid robot, we do recognize that there are many robots that don't have to take anything like that shape. As it happens, the robot tasks this year, ignore the surprise, that was fun stuff, but the eight tasks that are the challenges in the competition used to fail 100% of the time. Now, this one did all of them and did them actually rather well. Um, that's going to get better and better and better, and the form factors will change into caterpillars, into wasps, into hummingbirds, into dogs. There are many form factors in robotics for rubble that are getting very creative with what's happening in engineering and what's happening in the pathways, the algorithms that are helping us understand who's live and who's dead. We're also finding that there are technologies for looking through rubble looking for life signs that are getting much more robust than they used to be. If you know, well, actually, I didn't put it up there, but this is from about 10 days ago. This is out of MIT, and there are people now who can look using microwaves at the alterations and physiologic fluctuations that are enough to differentiate through digital subtraction the kind of things that show life versus not life. This is helpful, because the resources we have in a disaster response site, and I've deployed something like 20, 22 times, the resources that we have are often fragmented, often uneven, and anything we can do to help aim those resources effectively so that we have nodes of influence that can ramify from someplace where they're really needed instead of being scattered into where we think we might need it um, is helpful and I'm looking for creativity in any of these. This is an example of the crowdsourced OpenStreetMap volunteer technical communities that come together when we need to discover things that people coming in from the outside couldn't possibly know. The two people that are there, man in the yellow shirt, man in the gray shirt, um, are both local to Kathmandu, and they had mobilized volunteers, Kathmandu Living Labs, in a parking lot of a cafe and they had generated that map using those volunteers showing where people were no longer able to stay inside their homes because their homes were too unstable and had gathered some place where they needed care. That's fantastic work. And it was done in a matter of days by people that previously had not known each other using common and open source tools that were easily taught in multiple languages. Wonderful resource. Although I, as Daniel mentioned, I'm a clinical physician. I was chairman of the Department of Medicine. I was at DARPA for nine years. I was at Los Alamos National Laboratory for a few years. And I was director of an ICU and a clinic. I don't do that anymore. Because as I worked upstream in public health, in global public health and epidemiology, and now in disaster support, what I found most valuable is the provisioning of clean water. One figure that I haven't seen validated, but I'll toss it out just to share the meme, is that on any given day, 75% of all hospital beds on the planet are occupied by someone suffering some version of a waterborne disease. Again, I haven't been able to validate that statement. It's a great statement. If true, it's very helpful. It, un it helps me understand why I'm aiming the way I am. But water, once you've done the urgent life, limb, and eye stabilizing surgeries is the next thing that a displaced population needs. Here's what we did. 
Um, my partner is the guy in the green shirt on the other side in front of the white wall, um, and another member of our team is in front with the glasses. Um, this is Dharmasthali a little village in the foothills of Nepal that was absolutely leveled. You can't really tell the level of damage there, but many of the people who are in that photograph um, had family members who died in the earthquake and in the subsequent 7.3. We were there for that one. Um, the result of clean water is a healthier population, much more able to bounce back from what they've suffered. This is the technology we happen to be using right now. I have absolutely no financial interest in the company. I am merely a vendor of the stuff that they have, but the stuff that they have is a spun quartz nanofilament coated with titanium dioxide and activated by two tuned frequencies of LEDs, high intensity LEDs, in a mirror chamber, and it results in five photocatalytic processes that kill biologicals, organic chemicals, and heavy metals in ways that remove them. Kill is a relative term. It does kill the biologicals. It breaks down the organic chemicals and it plates out the heavy metals. It's amazing technology. It is very low power. It's completely silent. It lasts for a long time and it has one consumable that costs about $200 a year. So that kind of capability is coming for the kind of work that I do. And this is the result. The top, this is two different reports from THW, the German engineering firm that was working with us. And what we found is we had horrible water coming in. We had very good water coming out. We left that emergency system as a permanent solution for that community. We went back at the 120 day mark about a month ago and found that it's working perfectly. These things are good. This is a starfish. All of you know the reference. Um, she happened to come to my attention. Tragic story. She was the bright one in her class. She was a pretty happy girl. And now she has lost most of her functionality and she's maimed. And in her culture, apparently that's very difficult. She's not very acceptable. I think that there are things that we ought to be able to do from her, for her. And I have heard this morning and yesterday a number of possible solutions. I, had, I, I was in the room when that photograph was taken. Um, I have access to the people taking care of that girl. If some one of you very capable groups would like to do something to help that girl, I'm happy to put you in touch. You can reach me through all the usual ways here at Exponential Medicine. The Extreme Citizen Science Program at University College London under Muke Hakle's group is doing wonderful work to make sure that as much as we can, we understand that the environment that surrounds us, that's helping us with preparedness issues for things that we might not otherwise be able to see. That um, uh, cell phone app is in Beijing. And there's a program inside Beijing um, that is developing a new pandemic resilient eco community called Huadao in Chengdu near the Sichuan earthquake, in a memorial to the kids who were lost in the earthquake. Almost 7,000 children died. They are looking at a number of technologies to see what might be the bleeding edge of capabilities for protecting a population in 2015, 16, 17. This is an example of the kind of things they're looking at. I'm working with them on the health systems piece, and there are pieces there that are worth probably your analysis. And as Daniel asked, I'll give you one last slide that said, what do I need over the next while? I need this. I need these things. People who I work with need these things. UN needs these things. CDC needs these things. And anything you can do to help us get that far in the course of all the beautiful things that each of you are doing, we would love to hear more. You can reach me easily. Thanks very much.